Ark is a pretty cool game. You can tame dinosaurs, build huge bases, and feel like a power ranger. But even though the game is pretty cool, it's hard to ignore the rampant abuse, death threats, lawsuits, DDoSing, duping, mass bans, RMT, harassment, or the publisher of the game whose employees play on servers, cheat, crash them, and ban players who fight back. Today, I'm gonna fill you in on everything. Where Ark started, how its community slowly festered into one of the most notorious and toxic in the survival genre, why the game's vampiric publisher was able to destroy and profit off of countless IPs, and why the philosophy of Ark's original founders created one of the most addictive, profitable, and unwaning dinosaur games ever to have appeared on Steam. Welcome to Ark Survival Evolved. Before we begin, this is what you need to know about me. I've played Ark for 8 years and have 11,000 hours in it. I've also studied the game and its community for just as long, which is why this video exists, to share with the world what exactly happened with Ark and how it got its reputation. To understand where Ark started, we first need to talk about survival games because they stand as a genre which is proven highly addictive and enticing if the game is done right. Real life is a kind of survival game, a sandbox game, you already play it. You can go outside right now and strip naked, or you can buy 112 oranges and violently throw them at your neighbor's house. Generally, we like this freedom, and because survival games mimic real life in that freedom, we like survival games. Across the genre, the common theme of gathering items, building up shelters, fighting some unknown PvP or PvE threat, and ultimately surviving is a parallel to our world, and the veneer of these games begins to fade because of it. Survival games can make you feel something that a card game, a MOBA, or a single-player adventure game just can't. Games like Rust, Seven Days to Die, The Forest, and many more are prime examples of products in this genre. But none of these games, many largely inspired by Minecraft, had done anything super genre-bending or hugely innovative, that is until Ark Survival Evolved. Two guys, Jesse Rapjack and Jeremy Stieglitz, decided to head a new project called Ark Survival Evolved in 2014. Steglitz had just left his prior company and taken with him a non-compete agreement, which will come in later on, and Jesse was his partner just coming off of a Microsoft AR project. Jeremy and Jesse's goal was to create a survival game on Unreal Engine 4, which drew heavy inspiration from those games I mentioned in the survival genre like Rust. Generally within the genre, your survival game will fall into one of two boxes. Either it's like Rust, or it's like Seven Days to Die. But what's the difference? Rust is designed around player psychology, giving players a game where everyone else is a danger, and their progress is tied to a persistent survival server which other players can attack them on even when they're not online. Seven Days to Die, on the other hand, was designed around PvE elements, forcing players to focus on enjoying the zombies, the looting, and the building, instead of the never-ending threat of other people. The psychology is very different between these two games, and Ark, it created a third box of its own that basically didn't exist in the genre so far. Ark created what I would call the first true PvPvE survival game, at least on Steam. It's got PvE elements that the game was designed around, and yet it also has the PvP elements, which were done well enough that millions of players would go on to buy the game and get hooked on it just for that PvP itself. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. When Ark finally released into Steam's Early Access program June 2nd, 2015, it was a huge success. Hungry players wanted more content and faster. And this was the seed for toxicity, the first sign of it. When players wanted content or, you know, they got used to certain mechanics, if other content was then added or mechanics were changed, players would become easily outraged. Even before the PvP community established itself deep within the Ark sphere, just about everyone had something to say about the game design. Ark was so ripe with potential that everyone and their grandma had something to say about what should be added next. This slowly grew into more and more toxicity as developers were ridiculed, made fun of for growing delays of content updates, and even sent death threats. Why can't you just add this feature, where the quality of life changes? This dinosaur should be 30% less powerful. Aberration will be delayed by some weeks. Many employees at Studio Wildcard, the developer of Ark, have left since its launch eight years ago, including prior senior gameplay designer Kate Hendricks, community manager Jennifer Stuber, or Bubblywums, and more. And it's not a stretch to suggest they left, because at least partially of the outrage of fans and how toxic this neediness can quickly become. But this kind of toxicity is common in survival games. You see it when people freak out at the Fun Pimps, developer of Seven Days to Die, for constantly edging the Bandits update, or when players get mad at Rust developer Face Punch for various balance patches. You name it. However, it isn't as severe in many cases when compared to Ark. But if this toxic neediness and oversaturation of suggestions is common in the genre, why did Ark get so bad? This is where the game's unfortunate fate only a few months after its launch in 2015 would lead to growing that toxic seed into something much more ominous. 
After launch, ARK easily made $40 million in sales, which was about the exact amount of money that Stiglitz was then, only a few months later, sued over because he broke the non-compete agreement with his prior company, Trendy Entertainment, now called Chromatic Games. While the lawsuit was settled, we don't have public documents detailing exactly what the terms were by the end, but if we assume Jeremy had to pay upwards of $40 million to Chromatic, that would mean all the sales from ARK pretty much vanished. From there, Wildcard's options were limited, and I can imagine things were looking bleak. But they did something that would change the course of their game for many years to come. ARK was acquired by a company called Snail Games, which became its publisher and the owner to the entire IP. This was the turning point when things would go from bad to unhinged. But why? Well, let me give you a brief history on Snail Games. This company has a track record of being a kind of vampire publisher. The way they make money is by reaching out to developers, getting them to sign over the rights to their games in exchange for huge financial support, and then convincing the developer they'll be able to bring their dream game to life. Sounds pretty nice, right? Until you realize that actually the money Snail gives developers for them to promote their games is used to fluff it up, make it look ready to ship, and then plop into Steam's early access program for unsuspected consumers who buy it under the guise of early access, giving them millions in upfront sales, which are accompanied by romanticized dreams about the future and potential of the game, that toxic neediness I talked about that's basically self-sustaining within the communities of these games. Snail has done this again and again, leaving hundreds of thousands of players asking the developers of these games where the updates are. The trick is that the blame is put on the developers, which Snail slams with NDAs, forcing them to be completely helpless and unable to talk about what happened, because if they did, they'd get sued. You can see this pattern in basically every game they've ever made. Dark and Light, Outlaws of the Old West, Ark Park VR, and many more. It's pretty genius, right? Absorb some naive developers, help them promote their game to get tons of sales, and then stuff them in the metaphorical basement and vanish. Hidden. Safe profitable. As you can probably imagine, snail getting their disgusting vampiric snail goop all over the ARK IP was not good for consumers, but not in the way you'd expect. After acquiring ARK, snail games realized the huge cash cow they'd accidentally absorbed. I don't think they anticipated just how much of a success it would be, and they also realized they couldn't just suck the life out of the game and leave it for dead. That'd be a waste. Plus, Wildcard was too defensive. They had leverage. Other developers caved under Snail Games and vanished off the face of the earth, crippled by NDAs and threats of lawsuits. And while Studio Wildcard absolutely had that too, the co-founders were determined to see their game through, not just to the end, but beyond. Jeremy and Jesse hugely opposed things like pay-to-win mechanics or in-game cosmetics, and back when Kate Hendricks was still an employee, he later said that Wildcard threatened resignation if Snail forced them to implement things like, and I kid you not, a giant tech shield you pay real money to fuel. This unbreaking determination and persistence to survive and see their vision through only fed the toxicity in the community because players thought that if Wildcard seemed to know what they were doing and were determined to see it through, why were there so many bad decisions? After Snail took over, the changes to Wildcard's communication were not immediate. In fact, they took many years to fully go into effect, and until it started to get bad, Wildcard employees were still having open discussions with players. In the years that Snail started to crack down, ARK's PvP community grew substantially, and Hungry Beast was amassing more and more hatred and vitriol for the developers to make the game more PvP-focused. Around 2018 is when Snail Games decided they launched their own subset of servers on the official network called Conquest, and this was used for them to create an unfair environment where employees basically played on servers themselves, creating a tribe called T and doing anything they wanted whenever they started to lose. This was highly documented, and you can find it all over Reddit and YouTube, cases of these players getting banned on official servers for fighting against this tribe. And don't get me wrong, not all of the players fighting against T were innocent. Many were cheaters too, further showing just how toxic, twisted, and desperate PvPers were able to get for the sake of destroying the enemy, despite that enemy having direct communication with the owners of the IP itself. A really fruitless effort. T would crash and DDoS their own servers for an upper hand, banned players, spawned in items, and continued to do this for years. People outside the ARC community might take this as a joke or that there's a lack of evidence for it, but that couldn't be farther from the truth. All you need to do is look at the huge ban wave of a tribe called Island Boys that tried to get conclusive evidence of this abuse happening themselves in 2023, and needless to say, they did. Snail still does this, with new footage of cheaters on other games they own, like Atlas, releasing all the time. They still have the guts to force Wildcard to promote their Conquest servers in the crunch, and they'll continue to do this as long as they want, which, as you can imagine, does not help the community. What also does not help the community is when players break the boundaries of developers and intrude on their personal lives out of petty, unhinged obsession. 
See, when a game like Ark is run by the lunatics that consist of snail games, their unhinged behavior brings out that same kind of unhinged behavior in fans, and all you need to do to see the result of that is by looking at Ark's community manager, Cedric Burks, or Complex Minded, who tweeted out in 2021 for people to stop messaging his mother on Facebook so they could get unbanned, or for Wildcard to fix bugs, as if messaging his mom would somehow prompt Wildcard to listen. This is disgusting behavior. And I'm not gonna say that Snail Games has created the behavior of ARC players that are like this. They're just tormented people that will exist in any group of people if it's large enough. But Snail Games absolutely fosters the kind of environment that makes terrible behavior like this look almost as bad as the corporate insanity that Snail Games has a track record of committing. Over the years that the poison of snail games started to sink into the product, the developers of Studio Wildcard became less and less responsive. NDAs up the ass and nothing to be done about it. Either work under them or be fired. Remember that seed which started way back when Ark first came out into early access? Well, that seed became a goddamn tree because Ark spiraled into much more than just a game. It created a real money trading economy which allowed players to make tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars off Ark communities selling creatures, duping, and more. The content creators of Ark, like myself, over the waves or generations, have boosted the success of the game, and the relaxed policy for community content that the Ark IP has allows people to do just about anything and make as much money as they want off of Ark assets, music, and so on, to a degree, as long as there's interest in the game itself. Wildcard took the any publicity is good publicity approach and spread Ark to as many corners of the internet as they could. And this right here is a genius decision. If you allow your community to promote your game, twist, change, and adapt it in just about any way they want, it allows growth on a much larger and more explosive scale than just the developers trying to do it internally. And as you can guess, with this growth came also the growth of that toxic tree that was continuing to sprout branches and leaves of hatred, death threats, frustration at the unfair and pathetic actions of Snow Games, and most of all, a kind of helplessness of players. See, when you combine the circumstances of the Arc IP's ownership with the fact that the game was designed very well and is addicting, has a vibrant community, a huge underground economy, thousands of artists that obsess with this game, its characters, creatures, and so on, you get a situation akin to an abusive relationship. I've heard the same thing communicated from many thousands of players before. I hate this game, but I can't stop playing it. It's the guy! It sucks playing this shit! I'm so I can't quit. That brings us to the dark ages of the games community, a time that started not too long ago and which we're still in today. This period was marked by a severe lack of communication between developers and players, a confusion en masse, a new generation of ARC YouTubers that mostly took over the scene, a general frustration at the slightest changes or hints of what the future of the IP is from average players, and what slowly became a genuine lack of hope and interest in ARC from veteran fans. This time frame started in late 2020. All right, well, right now we've got another brand new game announcement for you. Check this out. At the 2020 Game Awards, Arc 2 was announced, followed by the animated series announcement. Fans were getting excited over the final story DLC for Survival Evolved, which was slated to release later in the summer of 2021. Things were looking all right, but this was also when Wildcard, for the first time, didn't really feel like that friendly neighborhood developer. It felt corporate. All these huge names in the animated series announcement. Vin Diesel, Russell Crowe, David Tennant, Gerard Butler, and Michelle Yeoh, and so on. That is so like the ARC developers, though, to just blow budget on shit that literally doesn't matter nearly as much as the, like, most important bits. ARC was becoming more than just a game or even an economy of its own. The IP was expanding to an entirely new medium, and the ARC 2 announcement, as much as it showed no gameplay and was not exactly very clear to players about what it would be like, it showed a new kind of vision for the franchise. However, as you may know, hype doesn't really last forever. If you say you're going to do something, you hype it up and then you fail to make good on those promises, repeatedly pulling the rug out numerous times, players won't stick around forever. The goofy goobers at Snail Games might assume so, and certainly they're right to a degree, but hardened veterans will pack their bags and find something else if there's a true failure to deliver. And that's why the Dark Ages started here. Genesis 2 came out, was a pretty big success, and things were looking fine. Then for the annual Extra Life charity event, where devs historically showed reveals for new DLCs or content they were making, it was pretty much unrevealing and fell a little flat, but of course they still raised money for Children's Miracle Network. Fast forward to 2022, and still nothing. No animated series hype, no ARC 2 hype, until summer when a new ARC 2 trailer came out and Fjorder was released for ARC Survival Evolved. They also made the game free for a week, which really inflated the number of players, as you can see here. After that, nothing. 
The rest of the year was mostly a ghost town, aside from the odd Jeremy tweet about how great the animated series was coming along or how much Dolly loved working on it. Extra Life didn't reveal anything crazy, and finally in December they released an animated series trailer, showing that something at least did exist, but alas, they had nothing to say about when it would release beyond maybe next year. There are only so many times you can flash big name actors in someone's face before you need to actually deliver a TV show. In 2023, we had a big oopsie where Jeremy said an ARC remaster on UE5 would be free, which was contradicted weeks later in a roadmap that clarified the remaster would actually cost money and be an entirely separate product fans would have to buy. This price was then changed twice in press releases following months later. The contradicting information created a huge stir and got press from far outside the ARC community to report on the situation, with IGN calling the ARC remaster a f you to fans. The community all the while had remained mostly intact. However, lots of creators have tried to find other games to play, and many have just been erring on the side of caution, waiting for anything of substance to be revealed that would help people understand what the future of their channels would look like if they stuck with ARK. But while the community has remained intact, as a creator it feels like someone poked the nest. So many comments I get nowadays are about how terrible the game is, how the corruption has destroyed it, and how they're moving on. And I can't lie, that is hard to see on a daily basis, and a part of what led up to this video. For the less vocal players, I've noticed a lack of hope, and a genuine disdain too. The cat's out of the bag with snail games, and I see it just about everywhere I go now in the art community. The company is a laughingstock and even the joke Twitter account Hod made that makes fun of them gets more likes and support than they do themselves. In a sense, it feels like the art community has found itself in a place of postmodernism. Everyone is painfully aware of the situation, and yet pessimism and nihilism is everywhere. Because if Snail keeps getting away with it, why would anyone expect it to change? So that brings us to now. At the time of this video's creation, August 2023. We still know almost nothing about the ARC remaster Survival Ascended, which is slated to release in October, and have a full year or more of early access to add all the content into the base game that ARC Survival Evolved had sold as separate DLCs, and to add insult to injury, they've massively changed their plans for ASA compared to the original roadmap, indicating an eclectic lack of awareness and a ton of confusion for content creators. Studio Wildcard has never in its existence since ARC's release been this this quiet, bad at communication, and seemingly outright confused. And as a result, very slowly people are dropping off. Players, and just humans in general, like to follow people and entities that know what they're doing and that they can trust have a vision and a specific goal in mind. They want to know that they're on the right track. And slowly the idea that Studio Wildcard and their disturbingly unprofessional owners know what to do next is fading. With that, the interest is fading too. ARK YouTubers are seeing less success and excitement. ARK players are downvoting Survival Evolved on Steam because its future is really unknown after the remake drops, and devs are stuck, unable to speak up because of their employers, or even worse, the potently toxic community that will jump on them. I'll be honest, in spite of it all, I'm still optimistic. Maybe that's my childish fanboyism that I've held onto for eight years over this company and this game? Maybe not. Part of the reason I made this video is because at this point in my life, I'm ready to accept that I won't be like the people who made ARK. I've played with so many ARK players over the years, gotten to know them personally, heard their stories of why they play the game time and time again, and it made me realize that I'm in a bubble. The thought of continuing to promote that bubble when I don't work for Studio Wildcard, I barely make enough to live off covering this niche game, and the reality is that there are many futures outside of it, has meant that I'm ready to move on. I accept that now. But my own tangents aside, to the ARC community, whether you have 5 hours or 50,000 hours, I want you to know this. ARC is a cool game. It's got dinosaurs, and it's got a lot of cool people who play it too. Within such a large cross-platform community that ARC is, there are bound to be a lot of toxic people, and the toxicity outlined in this video is the kind that I think most who are infected with it are unaware. The kind that people don't fully realize because they're so entrenched in a feeling of care and genuine love for this game. They want it to succeed. They want that so bad that the love becomes toxic. And so all I can offer to any of you who may feel that way, and to my past 15 year old self who obsessively critiqued the game on the Steam forums and wanted so much positive change for its future, it's okay. It's just a game. And games are meant to be fun. I hope you remember that. And for anyone genuinely sending death threats to game developers, go f yourself. At the end of the day, I think ARK can pull through if those in charge can catch lightning in a bottle again with ASA. The risk is, of course, that if they don't, they will split their community between the old, inferior game on UE4 and the new kid in town on UE5 that less people have bought. But mark my words, I assure you this. If the remake is a flop, and it's a critically underdeveloped, last-ditch attempt to save a confused franchise under childish, unsustainable management, then 
I, as an ARC YouTuber, will make the decision to leave this game behind and move on with my life. Either specializing in games that have a more secure future, or something else that scratches that itch. The choice is yours, Studio Wildcard. I hope you make the right one, for all of our sakes. I hope that you, the viewer, whether you're an ARC player or not, found this video useful, insightful, or entertaining at the very least. I hope you have a better idea of the situation that Studio Wildcard, Snail Games, and their gigantic ARC community have ultimately gotten stuck into at this point, and I hope the stakes are clear. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe because it allows me to continue doing what I love. And until next time, good luck, survivors.